morning, everyone. Welcome to the International UFO Museum and Research Center. My name is Don Schmidt. I'm one of the founders of the museum. Let me give you a little more background. I was a special investigator for the late Dr. Jalen Hynek, who was consultant to the Air Force Project Blue Book, the official investigation of the UFO phenomenon. And then when he founded the Center for UFO Studies in Chicago, I became his director of special investigations for 10 years. I served on his board of directors, and I was a skeptic. And the one case I wanted to go after was Roswell. We were so confident we would make a, a single weekend jaunt down to New Mexico and prove that this was nothing more than a weather balloon device, as the government still maintains, or something just as conventional. And here we are all these years later. We have this beautiful museum that has drawn over four million people from all over the world. We've done seven best-selling books on the case. The first one was made in the Golden Globe-nominated Best Picture, Roswell, starring Tom McLaughlin, Martin Sheen, Dwight Yoko. We've had five archaeological digs at the crash site, still looking for physical evidence. But to me personally, what I feel is the most significant is the fact that we tracked down and interviewed over 600 people who were directly or indirectly involved with what happened here back in 1947. Now a little history lesson. Whenever I ask where was the first atom atomic bomb detonated, how many would be aware that it happened just two hours west of here, Trinity site, north of White Sands Proving Grounds. And then you had ongoing atomic research here in 1947 at Los Alamos. You had all the testing of the captured German V-2 rockets just south of Trinity at White Sands. And here in Roswell, just south of town, you had the Roswell Army Airfield, which was the headquarters of the first atomic bomb squadron in the world. The elite within the military at that time, best officers, pilots, crew, doctors, nurses, you swept the broom on that base back in 1947, it was because you were the best sweeper in the entire U.S. military at that time. You all had top security clearances because of the atomic bomb. Late evening of July 2nd, the high desert of Lincoln County. Severe lightning storm. Ranchers described that between the thunderclaps, they heard what sounded like an explosion. Next morning, a ranch foreman by the name of W.W. W. Brazo discovers a huge debris field of the strangest material. No one's able to identify it. He brings in a couple of boxes, not to the military base, but to the sheriff, George Wilcox. Wilcox in turn contacts the base. He speaks with Head of Intelligence Major Jesse Marcel, who then alerts the very base commander, Colonel William Blanchard. Blanchard dispatches Marcel and a counterintelligence officer by the name of Captain Sheridan Kept. They go to the ranch, they investigate the crash. They're amazed by not only the vast amount of debris, but the fact that it covers an area of almost a mile long. They gather up and they fill two entire vehicles. There's still enough out there that it was required 50 to 60 troops, three full days, to load it all up, gather everything else that remains after Marcel and Cabot return back to the base early morning of July 8th, and at noon, mountain time, the Roswell Army Airfield puts out that famous press release that they actually captured a flying saucer. Five hours later, going up a chain of command, Colonel Blanchard, the base commander's boss, Brigadier General Roger Rainey, head of the 8th Air Force that the 509th Bomb Group was part of, he caused a press conference, not here in Roswell, but at his office at Carswell Army Airfield in Fort Worth. They invite one lone reporter of a hallway full of reporters in to take seven pictures, not of the actual wreckage, not the real material, but a substituted weather balloon with a radar reflector kite. You'll see some of the pictures out on the walls. And that would stand for the next 30 years. In fact, he's, he's pictured in two of the shots. Major Marcel, who I had mentioned going out to the ranch 
and gathering up and filling up his own vehicle. He would become the fall guy, the patsy. He's ordered, do as you're told, be a good soldier, and it'll all come out. In a few years, you'll be vindicated. You'll be a hero. He waits five years, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. 30 years later, he's diagnosed with terminal emphysema, and he realizes they're not coming out. Well, he comes out. And what he states is, quote, being familiar with all materials, both foreign and domestic, this was nothing made on this earth, end quote. Quite a profound statement. The number one intelligence officer in the world back in 1947, and before he dies, he stated that Roswell was not from this earth. So what are we talking about as far as the actual material? The balloon, again, is nothing more than neoprene rubber, reflective foil, as far as the hexagonal kite, wooden sticks, string, and tape. The actual material described to us by dozens of witnesses, both military and civilian, was paper-thin, metal-like material, practically weightless in your hands. You couldn't cut it, you couldn't burn it, even a bullet wouldn't penetrate it. Engineers at the base described how they took a 16-pound sledgehammer. Next time you're at a Home Depot, pick up a sledgehammer. They'll go through your car like tissue paper. And yet, this material, they described how every time they pounded on it, the hammer bounced right off. Not even a scratch. I-beam sections of the same material with strange symbology, symbols that ran the length of each piece. Silken strands of material like microfilament fishing line. You could hold a light up to one end and the light would emit out the opposite end. We were talking about fiber optics. Yet fiber optics were developed until about 1970. And then the most amazing material of all. The same nearly indestructible metal. But this you could crumble, you could crease, you could fold, you could crunch into a ball. And every time you placed it down, it would slowly unravel and flow like water and assume its original shape and size. In other words, it possessed perfect memory. We do not even have such material as of 2021. Yet, this is exactly what the witnesses described. And then we also add the little men, the little bodies they all described. And as one of the personnel when we were interviewed for CBS 48 Hours, and Phil Jones, the reporter, asked, well, how do we know they weren't from here? To which the personnel officer answered, they sure weren't from Texas. <laughs> so you all have realized by being here that Roswell is a destination city. You had to go out of your way to get here. That's why we appreciate your being here all the more. We invite you to also come back because we're gonna be adding more and more displays in this room, eventually, we will have a full-scale diorama of the crash site, the ship, the bodies, the wreckage, with the actual terrain and the Capitan <coughs> Mountains in the background. In other words, you will go back to 1947. We will take you there, just as all the witnesses describe it. Spend a little time reading the displays because you'll see as far as Witness by witness, they certainly are not describing a balloon, a plane, a rocket, or anything else conventional. They truly realize that they were dealing with something extraordinary. We had a festival over the last four days. So the gift shop, we had books left. So I have them up here if any of you are interested. I just happen to be the author. So as long as I'm in town and I leave, I go back home this afternoon, so I only get here five times a year. So whenever I am, I take advantage of this because I love as far as presenting at least a taste of what we have accumulated, what we put together as far as what I'm convinced is the biggest story of the millennium. And you're now having a part of that. So again, if any of you have questions or are interested in the books, I thank you. Thank you.
leaving Lake Alto. Two days in a row we got skunk fishing. Try again tomorrow. Try again the next day. Yeah, okay. Until hopefully we find something. Yeah. But my, our fishing guide back there is really bad at guide fishing. Well, you gotta make more money. So, but no, it's actually a really beautiful lake. Um, it's nice, it's cool. I'm just gonna hang out for a couple hours in the evening and see if we catch something. We count last year too, we count, but. we caught fish.